Hello everyone from uh, WHO headquarters here in Geneva. My name is Tarik and I welcome you uh, to this regular press briefing on COVID-19. Tonight uh, with us we have uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is the head of WHO Program for Emergencies. We also have Professor Hanan Balhi, who is Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance. And with us uh, also today, we have Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, who is our Chief Scientist. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to Dr. Tedros, I would just like to remind everyone uh, who is on Zoom, our f uh, colleagues journalists who want to ask questions, that they can also listen in six UN languages, plus Portuguese, plus Hindi, and ask uh, uh, questions in six UN languages and Portuguese. Uh, I will give a floor now to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We now have more than 6 million cases of COVID-19 across the world and have lost more than 370,000 people to the virus. As we work with governments across the world to suppress the virus and accelerate science around diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, we also continue to respond to other health emergencies and new disease outbreaks. The government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo announced today that a new outbreak of Ebola virus disease has been detected near the city of Mbandaka in Equator province. The announcement follows a complex Ebola outbreak in Eastern DRC, which seems to be in its final phase. The new one is on the other side of DRC, Western DRC. WHO will continue supporting DRC in tackling Ebola as well as responding to COVID-19 and the world's largest measles outbreak. Every week, WHO continues to provide the world with new and updated technical guidance based on the best evidence during this pandemic, we have seen that mass gatherings have the potential to act as super-spreading events. To assist groups planning such gatherings, WHO released updated guidance to help organizations determine how and when mass gatherings can safely resume. For example, WHO has worked closely with several supporting organizations, including FIFA, UEFA, Formula One and religious groups, including Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which oversees the Hajj as they conduct risk assessments around mass gatherings. WHO has updated its risk assessment tool so that organizations can score each risk factor and control measure, which results in an overall risk score. Ultimately, WHO advice on the risk assessment, and then organizations make the decision on how best to proceed. While we all want sporting events to restart, we want to make sure that it's done as safely as possible. We all know that the impacts of COVID-19 extend well beyond the death and disease caused by the virus itself. The pandemic has forced countries to make difficult choices about suspending some health services. Building on previous guidance on maintaining essential health services through the COVID-19 pandemic, today we are providing operational guidance on how best to put that into practice. Ensuring coordination and development of new ways to deliver care while limiting visits to health facilities is key to keeping people safe and ensuring health systems are not overburdened. This means using digital technologies to deliver some routine services remotely and expanding the amount of medications delivered to the home. One of the areas in which health services have been particularly affected 
is in care for people with non-communicable diseases, including diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, or a chronic respiratory disease. We already know that people living with NCDs are more vulnerable to becoming severely ill or dying from COVID-19. At the same time, many people living with non-communicable diseases are no longer able to access the medicines that they need. WHO conducted a rapid assessment of service delivery for NCDs during the COVID-19 pandemic with 155 countries submitting data. The results released today show that more than half of the countries surveyed have partially or completely disrupted services for treatment of hypertension, half for treatment of diabetes and related complications, and 42% for cancer treatment, and 31% for cardiovascular emergencies. Rehabilitation services have been disrupted in almost two-thirds of countries. The COVID-19 response must therefore be inclusive of the health care needs of people living with non-communicable diseases. One of the main causes of NCDs is tobacco. This year's WHO's World No Tobacco Day focused on reaching young people to educate them on tobacco industry tactics used to manipulate them into using deadly products that kill 8 million people every year. Even during this global pandemic, where we know tobacco puts users at a higher risk of severe disease and death, the tobacco and nicotine industry persist with their dangerous marketing tactics that aim to attract new users. Just as we continue to respond to well-known health threats like tobacco, we're also responding to one of the most urgent challenges of our time, the threat of antimicrobial resistance. I'm glad to say a record number of countries are now monitoring and reporting on antibiotic resistance, marking a major step forward in the global fight against drug resistance. But the data they provide reveals that a worrying number of bacterial infections are increasingly resistant to the medicines we have traditionally treated them with. As we gather more evidence, it's clear that the world is losing its ability to use critically important antimicrobial medicines all over the world. On the demand side, in some countries, there is an overuse of antibiotics and antimicrobial agents in both humans and animals. However, in many low- and middle-income countries, these life-saving medicines are out of reach for those that need them, leading to needless suffering and death. On the supply side, there is essentially very little market incentive to developing new antibiotics and antimicrobial agents, which has led to multiple market failures of very promising tools in the past few years as well as finding new models to incentivize sustainable innovation as seen with the COVID-19 solidarity trial, we must find ways to accelerate viable candidates. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to an increased use of antibiotics, which ultimately will lead to higher bacterial resistance rates that will impact the burden of disease and deaths during the pandemic and beyond. In the current clinical management of COVID-19 interim guidance, WHO has outlined the appropriate use of antibiotic therapy for medical professionals to treat patients. Therefore, both tackling antimicrobial resistance while also saving lives. I will conclude by saying that we have received questions about Friday's announcement by the President of the United States of America. The world has long benefited from the strong collaborative engagement with the government and the people of the United States. The U.S. government's and its people's contribution and generosity 
towards global health over many decades has been immense, and it has made a great difference in public health all around the world. It is WHO's wish for this collaboration to continue. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tadros, for these remarks. Uh, we will uh, now go for a session of questions and answers. I will remind journalists uh, to be concise, to ask only one question so we can take as many as possible. I would also like to acknowledge and thank interpreters who are here with us and who will uh, make sure that uh, journalists can answer their questions in six UN languages plus Portuguese and also listen answers in those languages. So uh, if we are technically fine with, uh, with starting with questions, I will call on Helen Branswell first from Stat News. Helen. Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Tedros, can you please tell us what um, the process is for a country to withdraw from the WHO? I don't believe there's anything in the constitution that um, spells out a mechanism for withdrawal. Can you please explain? Uh, thank you. I think for the moment, what I have said in my speech uh, would be enough. Um, and for the process, if you need um, additional information, uh, we can do it uh, some other time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, that, uh, we will go now to um, Kamran Kasimov from Azerbaijan uh, Real TV. Uh, Kamran, uh, do you hear us? Do you hear me? Uh, yes, Kamran. Hello. Greetings from Azerbaijan, from Real TV. Uh, my question to Dr. Tedros, because he claimed about that. We got information uh, one hour ago. A record number of countries are now monitoring and reporting on antibiotic resistance marking and major step forward in the global fight against drug resistance. But the data they wait for a while provide reveals that a worrying number of bacterial infections are increasingly resistant to the medicines uh, at hand to threat them. Because as post-Soviet uh, Republic, Azerbaijan, we need for information, more information about that, Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you, maybe. Ask Alec. Please, uh, please, Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you, thank you, Cameron. I, I think uh, Professor Balchi may, uh, may add here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. And um, I'd like to also refer to Dr. Tedros' uh, summary also a few minutes ago about the problem with antimicrobial resistance. I think it is one of those entities that are extremely difficult to identify, and we're very happy that we've at least have started the, f the first steps in releasing the GLASS report, uh, the third uh, edition of the GLASS report, where 66 countries from 22 countries in 2018 have provided data on the amount and types of resistance they have to certain antibiotics, to certain uh, pathogens. And I think that step is extremely important so we can look into uh, the magnitude of the problem within the different countries, and we hope that more will engage. But I do want to emphasize that the problem with AMR or antimicro uh, antimicrobial resistance is that it's very unlike many of the other entities. It's, it's a mechanism that can be applied in many different pathogens. So we would not be able to strictly identify it in every single pathogen, although we hope to reach that point. The solutions for antimicrobial resistance, as you might uh, want it to, to understand, for each country, it's going to be very different. It's one of those problems that have been tackling high, mid, and low-income countries. And the stimulators for resistance in each of these countries is very different. And that's why the WHO has taken a big step in trying to address this issue in a customized fashion, in a multi-sectoral fashion in each country, where we would su uh, support with technical advice um, for the countries on how to mitigate those issues, whether it's overuse in the human world through misuse in patients or in the agriculture side, and also to try to understand how to improve the issues of hygiene so that we do not replace good hygiene, whether it's infection prevention control in the human side 
or hygiene in the animal side by the excessive use of antimicrobials. So the problem is very complex, and we will be working with the countries on trying to find uh, ways of improving it in each specific country as needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, Professor Hanan Balki, who is our Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, now uh, we will go to Antonio from Lusaphone News Agency. Antonio, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for taking my question. I would like to ask about what we know already about the lasting effects of COVID-19 on people, uh, name, namely those who have been hospitalized and put in ICUs, and how should health, uh, health authorities keep following these people in the uh, intervening months? Thank you. So thank you for this very important question. Yes, as you as you know, uh, millions of people now have recovered from uh, COVID-19 infection, um, and we are uh, starting to follow them more systematically. Um, as we've outlined in our update to the clinical management guidance that we published last week, we now have um, a section specifically on the rehabilitation for patients with COVID-19. Um, what we know from those that are infected um, so far globally is that the vast majority of people who have had COVID-19 infection will recover uh, without problem. There will be some individuals who have had severe disease or more severe disease or critical disease that have been in hospital for prolonged periods of time. They may have had intubation. They've had severe pneumonia. They may have had toxic shock. They may have had quite some serious, serious disease. And these individuals may have a longer um, effect. And so what we need to do is follow them over time to understand how they recover and what long-term care, if any, they need. So we're just starting to learn from this, um, from the patients who have recovered. Um, and we hope to be able to have a more systematic way we could provide care for those that leave hospital. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff, for this uh, answer. Now we will go to Kai Kupferschmidt from Science. Kai. Hey, Tariq. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I just wondered whether one of you, maybe Dr. Tedros, might want to address um, some of what we're seeing in the U.S. I mean, so obviously, you know, these, these street protests have um, kind of raised the, the fear that, that, you know, they could lead to more spread. At the same time, people have pointed out that the systemic racism that is being um, protested here is in itself a public health crisis. Um, and I wonder whether you have any, any comments on, on how to balance these things. So Kai, thank you for this uh, important question. Um, I won't speak specifically about any particular events, but what we can say and what has been highlighted in the DG speech today about mass gatherings in particular is that with increasing social mixing and people coming together, um, particularly in areas if the virus is not under control, um, that close contact between people can pose a risk. Um, and at the heart of our guidance that we've published uh, recently on mass gatherings are supporting the people who are organizing those, whether these are mass gatherings uh, for sport or for religious events or for, for any other reason, um, to ensure that those who plan those undertake a very serious, rigorous risk assessment, um, which looks at the local context, which looks at the transmission intensity in that area, what we know about the virus, where it's circulating, and about the potential activity that would take place during that event, uh, whether it's the number of people or the proximity of people together, um, to make sure that the, the system is in place to keep people separated. Physical distancing remains a very important aspect to control and suppression of transmission of COVID-19. This is not over yet. Um, and we need to ensure that in, in locations that are considering these events, uh, mass gathering events, that you have a system in place to, to prevent and detect and respond to any such cases. Um, and so uh, we are here to support uh, those who are planning um, mass gatherings events and to ensure that that planning takes place in a rigorous way. Many thanks for this. Uh, next question goes to South Africa Broadcasting. And we have um, Sophie with us, Sophie Mokena. Sophie, can you hear us, please? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I 
want to ask uh, Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, uh, currently we see African countries beginning to ease uh, the measures that they took earlier on to uh, fight this COVID-19, uh, the issue of lockdown. South Africa in particular, uh, today starting with level three, having children uh, perhaps uh, going out, some of them to schools, even though that uh, decision has been reversed. What is your advice to African countries who have started uh, with process of easing down the lockdown, in particular when you look at the sub-Sahara region? Um, I can begin and, and possibly uh, Dr. Tedros will supplement. Um, I think that the advice is pretty much the same as we, we have given uh, across the, the whole uh, pandemic uh, for countries. Uh, in exiting lockdown, and we understand that countries uh, uh, in exiting lockdown are trying to put economies uh, back on track, trying to bring social cohesion and social interaction back, and, and, and that's laudable. What we've asked for is a careful stepwise approach that each move is measured and the impact of the, of the release of measures is measured in a way that we can see any increase in cases uh, and, if necessary, reapply measures. Uh, we've also said that you have to replace lockdown with uh, something else. And we've said consistently, I think, and Dr. Tedros has said this on many occasions, we need to have a strong, empowered community who are educated and participating in the response willingly um, um, and are able to sustain a new normal, to able to sustain the, the new behaviours, the new behaviours around physical distancing, hygiene and other things. We have to have a strong public health uh, response and I would commend South Africa in the way in which it's uh, energised and mobilised its community health workers for both community education and surveillance, the way that the capacity to detect, test and trace cases has increased uh, across South Africa through the use of mobile clinics and mobile teams. Um, uh, and that measured approach allows countries to come out of the so-called lockdowns and replace lockdowns with a more comprehensive set of public health and social interventions that will allow us to live in a more sustainable way with this virus until we reach a point where we have vaccines or other interventions that may eventually allow us to eliminate the virus. Um, that though being said, uh, is a difficult challenge for many countries, particularly in the South, where the concepts of social distancing, of hygiene, uh, of surveillance are difficult to achieve, especially when many people live in poverty uh, and in overcrowded and in uh, conditions where those um, objectives are hard to reach. So we need uh, the external world. Uh, uh, other countries need to provide all support possible to, particularly to countries in Africa, to achieve those goals in terms of being able to support communities, support surveillance, uh, and support the health system to cope. But we believe progress is being made. In, in Africa in general, <clears throat> we've seen a stabilization of the situation. However, in some countries, the disease continues to be on the rise, um, and therefore we have to be very, very careful and, and ever vigilant. Uh, over the coming weeks uh, and months. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, nice to hear your voice. Um, I just would like to add, of course, uh, Mike had um, covered, uh, you know, the, your question, but just to add, uh, first of all, one thing which was very important that Africa did was the um, meeting in February that helped um, of the ministers of health that helped develop the um, continental strategy uh, and aligning uh, national uh, plans and strategies with the continental strategy. And then the other important development was the creation of the coalition of leaders uh, by uh, uh, President Ramaphosa, who is the current African Union uh, chairperson, and also um, the leadership by uh, the African Union Commission chairperson, Dr. Musafaki. And then uh, the other important step was um, the social distancing uh, in Africa, the measures, social distancing measures, actually started while the number of cases were, were low. So it was uh, done as 
early as possible. I think that helped in slowing uh, the um, uh, epidemic. Uh, now, um, the uh, issue is uh, Africa is again uh, starting to open up. So when it opens up, uh, the um, recommendation from uh, uh, WHO is it has to be a phased approach and South Africa is doing that and many countries are doing that. It has to be a phased approach. And at the same time, uh, we need to continue the, um, you know, to strengthen, especially the case identification, tracing and, and other public health uh, measures and especially the involvement of the community and the involvement mobilizing community health workers uh, to be involved, as, as Mike said, which is happening in South Africa and, and other countries, and really strengthening that, that part and following the developments seriously and strictly. So based on changing situations to take uh, measures like, for instance, some of the measures which are taken in opening up can be reversed if there are challenges. For instance, uh, South Korea did that when it opened up and then uh, started to see some clusters of cases, then started to take action, social distancing, which is tailored, tailored to that. So the vigilance and the strict follow-up uh, will be very important. But of course, as Mike said, I understand and I'm from Africa, how difficult it is to in, uh, you know, implement some of the social distancing measures, uh, but based on the situation, adapting to the situation, taking the maximum measures you can take uh, will be very, uh, very important. Um, so thank you again, Sophia, and um, look forward to continue to talking to you. Many thanks, Dr. Tadros and Dr. Ryan. Uh, next question comes from uh, BBC. We have Naomi online. Uh, Naomi, please go ahead. Hello, can we hear Naomi from BBC? Can you unmute yourself, please? Hello. Sorry. Um, I would like to ask about these reports from Italy that uh, doctors there have suggested coronavirus is somehow losing potency. What do the panel make of that? So thank you for the question. I'll, I'll, I'll begin uh, and perhaps others would like to supplement. So um, what we are learning about this virus um, in terms of its transmissibility and in terms of its severity, this, these are the two major features we've been, we've been talking about since the beginning. Um, in terms of its transmissibility, the thing we measure is the reproduction number. How many cases, uh, ad secondary cases, can one case infect? Um, and that reproduction number naturally is above two, uh, which means it has an epidemic potential to take off if we allow it to. Um, what we've seen across a number of countries is that that remains true. Um, but there is the ability for this virus to cause what the DG mentioned today are these super spreading events, um, which take place in closed facilities or in, in situations where you have very close contact with people. And that we've seen across a number of countries, and I would argue in all countries. Um, the other thing we look at when we think of potency and we think of is the severity that this disease causes. And consistently, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, causes a range of illness in people that it infects consistently across the globe, um, where the majority of people have a more mild infection, some have a moderate infection with, with pneumonia, and then about 20% of individuals will have a severe disease. That is consistent. So in terms of the transmissibility, um, that has not changed. In terms of the severity, that has not changed. But what I think is important and what these scientists may be talking about, because I haven't seen that particular report, is that there are measures that we can put in place to reduce transmission, to suppress transmission, and this includes finding, testing, isolating, caring for all cases, tracing and quarantining all contacts, ensuring that we have a mobilized and engaged public, ensuring that we have an all of society, all of government approach. These fundamentals that we've talked about from the beginning remain consistent, remain the plan. 
And we know that early treatment, early identification, early oxygen support, when needed, can save lives. And so these are the things that I think can reduce the potency, that can reduce the power of this virus. But if we let the virus go, it will transmit. If we let the virus go, it will infect people and it will cause severe illness in about 20% of people. So the important message is that there are things that we can do to suppress transmission and to save lives. Uh, and if I, could, I mean, just supplement, I think we, we've said this many times, all new observations uh, are, are very important and, and, and should uh, stimulate uh, further inquiry. Um, new viruses in human populations can can do one of two things. They can evolve and become less pathogenic, or they, sometimes they can become even more pathogenic. Uh, the, it, it is not in the interest, of, obviously, of the virus to, uh, to, to, to kill everybody that it infects, because the virus can survive better if it can transmit from person to person. And we see this with many of the illnesses, <clears throat> the childhood illnesses we have. Um, but we need to be careful. This is still a killer virus. And uh, there are still thousands of people every day dying from this virus. So uh, we need to be exceptionally careful not to create a sense that all of a sudden the virus, by its own volition, has now uh, decided to be less pathogenic. That is not the case at all. We also need to respect the fact that many people have fought very hard at community level, health workers and others, to suppress this virus. Um, and it may be, and they, we have to look at this and look at the various hypotheses for what our colleagues in Italy are observing, but it may uh, in some ways have something to do with uh, the, the dose and length and intensity of exposure, because we do know with other viruses and other diseases that the dose and length and intensity of exposure can affect the severity of an illness. In other words, the, 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 the absolute amount of virus you're exposed to can determine how severe ultimately your illness can be, and that has been proven with other diseases. We don't know that that's the case in, 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 uh, in the case of COVID-19, but it may not be that the virus itself is becoming less potent. It may be that we are, as a community and as a globe, successfully reducing the number, intensity and frequency of exposure to that virus, which on the face of it, uh, the virus then looks weaker. But it may be weaker because we're doing better, not because the virus itself is weakening. I hope the virus is weakening. We all hope that. But we cannot, at this point, take that chance. Uh, and we have to continue to do the things we're doing. But we will speak to our colleagues in Italy and in other places. It is always important to take any observation on this virus seriously, to inquire, to, to create a scientific dialogue, uh, and certainly not to uh, be negative about any hopeful message. But at the same time, we need to be realistic and be driven by facts. And just to add to that, there is a, a huge global collaboration of scientists that share the genomes um, of this virus from around the world. And currently, in this um, publicly available database called GISAID, we have over 32,000 whole genome sequences of this virus from all parts of the world. And scientists are regularly updating their knowledge on the mutations that are happening. And we expect mutations to occur um, because this is a virus and all RNA viruses, there is uh, constantly uh, some mutations happening. So scientists are tracking what these mutations mean. And so far, there's been no correlation with, uh, with either transmissibility or with potency or, in fact, with any mutations that are interfering with either diagnostic tests or with, um, with vaccines that are being developed um, targeted to the spike protein. So I think this kind of a, a global database that scientists from around the world can, can access, can collaborate on, is very, very important and useful for us to study the changes in the virus and then correlate it with some of these uh, clinical and epidemiological questions. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Swaminathan, Dr. Ryan, and Dr. Van Kirchhoff. Uh, we'll go to our next question. It's a NHK Japanese broadcaster. We have Shoko with us. Shoko? Hello, Tari. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for taking my question. So regarding the announcement by the United States, uh, Dr. Tetris, when were you officially informed by the United States of their intention of withdrawal? Thank you. I think this question has been dealt with uh, Shoko. I don't know if 
Dr. Teres wants yeah, to? I think uh, we have answered the question already, and um, the announcement was last fr Friday, as, you, as we all heard from, from the media. And the only uh, communication we have or announcement was actually that Friday's uh, media announcement from the U.S. Many thanks. So I think this question has been answered. So uh, let's try to get uh, Antonio from FA Spanish uh, News Agency. F, uh, Antonio? Uh, I think uh, just to let everyone know that we have a little issue on streaming on our social media platforms while it still goes on on the Zoom, if I understand correctly. So for uh, all those who are watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, hopefully we will get back soon. But in the meantime, we will continue with the press conference and those who are on Zoom and who are still with us. So let's uh, try to get uh, Antonio from EFE. Antonio? Sí, hola, buenas tardes. Quería preguntar a los expertos de la OMS qué opinan del hecho de que los gobiernos de Estados Unidos y Brasil sigan promocionando el uso de hidroxicloroquina en el tratamiento contra la COVID-19, pese a que la, la OMS ha detenido los ensayos clínicos con este fármaco. So maybe I can start. Um, so the WHO's solidarity trial um, has four treatment arms compared to the standard of care, and one of them is hydroxychloroquine. Um, so the week before last, there was a publication that came out, which was an observational uh, study in a large number of patients that concluded that the risk of death is higher among COVID-19 patients who received hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, um, either alone or in combination with a macrolide antibiotic, compared to those who did not. As you know, the solidarity trial is governed by a steering group, and the executive committee met urgently to consider the implications and decided that while the Data Safety Monitoring Board is looking at the data from the trial, that it was safer um, to protect patients um, from any possible harm to actually uh, temporarily suspend enrollment into the hydroxychloroquine arm of the solidarity trial. So it was a temporary suspension. The Data Safety Monitoring Board is looking at our own data, and we should have that information within the next 24 hours or so to make a decision. Meanwhile, we, we do know that there's another large trial going on in the UK called the Recovery Trial, which has enrolled more than 11,000 patients. Their Data Safety Monitoring Board looked at the hydroxychloroquine arm versus the standard uh, arm and did not find anything to concern them. And they are actually continuing with, uh, with their enrollment. So to answer the other question of countries using hydroxychloroquine, we have um, always believed that it's important to generate data on safety and efficacy of any of these treatments because this is a new disease uh, we do not have the evidence. Um, we want to try, of course, treatments as quickly as possible, but the best way and, and the only really uh, robust way of generating evidence is to do well-designed randomized trials which enroll enough patients to make a definitive conclusion on safety and efficacy. Hydroxychloroquine has been proposed both for the treatment and for the prevention of COVID-19, but really we need to wait for results from the randomized trials to know whether it's effective in either or both, um, both situations. And till then, um, uh, doctors who are prescribing it do so basically under a sort of a compassionate use uh, protocol, um, which is, uh, needs to abide with the uh, laws and the regulations of the country concerned. But we hope that that the trials that have already started will continue to enroll and will be able to answer these questions definitively because that's going to be really, really important. Thank you. So if I could just add something, not specifically on the hydroxychloroquine, I just want to point out that while the world is looking for 
therapies, looking for antivirals and other therapies specific for COVID-19, there is supportive treatment that is available for patients. And I think that's an important message that we need to continue to, to push out because um, people with pneumonia, people with severe pneumonia, people with um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, people with septic shock, people who need oxygen and respiratory support, um, we have guidance that's out to work with clinicians where we've learned from frontline clinicians who are dealing with COVID-19 patients and how they're dealing with patients now before we have that treatment. We want the treatment, we want a safe and effective treatment, and these clinical trials are underway. But until we have that, there is some supportive care that is out there and that uh, clinicians can use. Um, in addition to that, we are working with uh, make, ensuring that healthcare facilities and health facilities have the right equipment to be able to care for patients depending on the severity of their system, um, to build treatment centers in areas that don't have treatment centers. And so there's a large amount of work with huge teams that are trying to build um, treatment centers in countries that don't have those so that they can be used for COVID-19 patients and any patients that need care. We're working to supply oxygen to ensure that oxygen can be available to people who need it across different countries. So I just wanted to add that um, to say that while we are working hard to accelerate the, 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 the knowledge around safe and effective treatments, there are supportive treatments that are out there and we're working with clinicians worldwide, listening to them, learning from them, putting out guidance, doing training so that there is care that, that's out there in the meantime. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Van Kierkov. Uh, it seems we are back on our social media platforms, uh, so uh, those who were watching us uh, on those channels uh, may have opportunity to see those few minutes that were missing on our footage that will be available uh, afterward. Uh, I understand that uh, on Zoom, where we have our journalists, uh, everything was functioning normally. We have a time for one or two more questions, so let's go to Jamil. Uh, Chade, Geneva-based correspondent for Brazilian media. Jamil? Hello, Jamil. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tarek. Thank you to all of you. Uh, Mr. Ryan, last week we spoke about, uh, you spoke about Brazil and how the situation was still uh, very intense. A week later, we have a, an even more difficult situation in Brazil. Uh, is the war still to come? Uh, how do you see uh, the crash of the, the case in Brazil? Um, it, it, it's difficult to predict, but uh, if we look at this as a, uh, we look at the different uh, the hemispheres, I mean, uh, five of the ten countries worldwide reporting the highest new number of cases in the past 24 hours are in the Americas, uh, Brazil, USA, Peru, Chile, and Mexico. Uh, and that covers a, a vast stretch. Um, the countries, though, reporting the, the biggest increases are Brazil, uh, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Haiti, Argentina, Bolivia. Uh, and we're seeing, while the numbers are not exponential in, in some countries, we are seeing uh, a progressive increase in cases on a daily basis. It's across a range of different countries, um, and countries are having to work very, very hard uh, to both understand uh, the, the scale of infection, but also health systems are beginning to come under pressure uh, across the region. <clears throat> um, we're particularly concerned about uh, places like Haiti because of the inherent weakness in the, in the system. There are other countries in the Americas in which uh, health systems are also weak. Uh, there are different responses uh, by different countries uh, in the region. Uh, we see very good examples of countries who are, have an all of government, all of society, inclusive scientific driven approach. And I think we're seeing in other situations uh, 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 an absence uh, and weakness in that. Uh, I think uh, we now absolutely need to focus on supporting particularly central and, and so the, South America in their response. Uh, the DG has said many times, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And uh, many, many weeks ago, the world was extremely concerned about what was going to happen in potentially South Asia or in Africa. And uh, to, to a certain extent, the situation in those two settings is still difficult, but it's stable. 
clearly the situation in many South American countries is far from stable. There's been a rapid increase in cases, and those systems are coming under increasing pressure. And they need our support. They need our solidarity. Um, and uh, the complexities of the population structure, the number of people living in urban settings, the urban poor, there are so many factors that drive and, and increase the intensity of transmission. But I would certainly characterize that uh, Central and, and South America in particular have very much become the intense uh, zones of transmission for this virus as we speak. Uh, and I don't believe that we have reached the peak in that transmission. Uh, and at this point, I cannot predict when we will. But what we do need to do is to show solidarity to the countries of Central and South America. Uh, we need to stand with them. We need to provide the support that we can to help them overcome this virus, as we have done collectively for countries in other regions. This is the time to stand together uh, and leave no one behind. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. So maybe the last question for today's press conference. We will go to India, India TV, and we have with us Siddhant Mamtani. Uh, can, we, uh, can we hear okay, Siddhant? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, so my question basically follows up on what Sophie had to say. Uh, the general consensus in India is that the lockdown was imposed in the country at a very early stage when the cases were fairly low. The fourth phase of lockdown uh, came to an end yesterday and a partial uh, unlocking of services began today. So at the same time, the cases, number of cases in the country are touching 200,000 now. So do you think there's a relation between these partial opening of services and the rising number of cases? And if so, then how do we balance the resumption of economic activities and at the same time control the coronavirus lockdown? Thank you. Um, uh, I think you've sort of answered your own question there uh, quite well uh, in, in the sense that it's exactly that question. How do you balance the needs of the economy and society against the needs to control this disease? And that certainly cannot be done uh, from a place like Geneva. That can only be done by national governments who are working locally to, to understand the local situation, understand the local context, and absorb the global guidance and the global scientific consensus that's building. And we've had many, many countries uh, over the last number of weeks and months at our weekly briefings with all our member states and missions. And it's been striking to me uh, the success that countries have had, and, and I've been trying to be honest to understand what has been the, what's been the magical formula for, for, for success in this response. And, and to me, what, I, what I'm seeing beyond the epidemiology and beyond the virus is that countries that have taken real ownership of the problem politically uh, and pulled in the maximum amount of information from outside and then adapted and driven a local response with communities on board have done well. This has not been about global knowledge just uh, stopping the virus. There's a, an essential second step, and that has been responsible, open governments looking and seeking for that scientific information within the country and from outside, and translating that into actions and, 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 and into programs that communities understand and accept and support. Uh, and where, where governments have taken that all of society, all of government approach, where they've been open to the global and local science, where they've been sensitive and empathic to local population needs, they have found that balance. But that balance and that point of balance cannot be set externally. That is primarily the responsibility of national government. Uh, that is what government is there for. So in that sense, WHO will continue to drive the gathering of global science, global knowledge, global epidemiology, continue to do our best to synthesize that into the best guidance we can, to work through our country offices with each government to try and find that balance. But ultimately, that balance comes from a responsible government listening to science, listening to the population, and balancing uh, these very difficult questions in a way that people can look at and, s and see that a transparent job is being done to protect them, the economy, their society. Uh, not easy, not easy to achieve. But I think governments who have done that uh, seem to have had a success. And we wish India uh, every success in that. Uh, India is 
one of the largest countries in the world, um, a center of science, a center of public health, as I've said many times in the past. It did implement measures early uh, and has a huge capacity to continue doing the surveillance and the community engagement that has so much demonstrated in the past. But also, uh, India has one of the densest populations in the world, has pockets of real poverty and underprivilege, and we really do have to ensure that those populations are protected uh, and that India remains vigilant, ever vigilant, moving forward as it takes slow steps towards uh, fully opening its society. I don't know, Sumi, you, you may have a, a comment on this, given that India is your home country. No, I think you put it well, Mike. I think there are big challenges. And, uh, and one of the unique challenges, I think, is the density of population, particularly in the urban areas. And what I've seen of the data uh, from India is 70 percent of cases and deaths are in the 13 cities, the most populated cities. So that's where really there's a need to focus attention. And even within those cities, there are areas that are micro clusters of disease. And of course, those people are also probably in the, most, uh, in the weakest, uh, most vulnerable uh, living conditions as well. And so I think this is a, is, is a challenge but needs a, a, a strategy to address those specific challenges that exist. And I think it's a combination of what you were saying, Mike. It's a combination of involving the local community, developing a plan that is bottom-up, that is participatory. It should be based on real data. A lot of testing and contact tracing needs to be done. And, um, and there needs to be constant monitoring and, uh, and, 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 um, and a constant, perhaps, reorientation of the, of the plans based, uh, based as the data um, emerges. There's also the issue of protecting the, the frontline workers, whether they're policemen or whether they're drivers, bus drivers, ambulance drivers, nurses, and doctors. I think we must not forget that these people are at very high risk when they go into these um, densely populated and, and high incidence settings. And, uh, but there are good, there are good models that, that um, uh, within India that have shown that it is possible to do, and so I think we have to remain optimistic. If I could just briefly add, so going beyond India, I think the, the responses so far um, specific to the context of India are critical. But I just want to take it a little bit beyond that to say that there are a lot of countries right now that are lifting lockdowns, so-called lockdowns. And a lot of them are doing it in a slow way. Um, and as Mike and as Sumia has said, it needs to be done, you know, very, it's very context specific. And so it, n not everything can be lifted all at once. This virus isn't homogenous. It doesn't spread evenly. It likes to exploit the vulnerabilities. It likes to exploit close contact. Um, and so it's important to, to have these lifting of these measures done in a data-driven way and to have the systems in place to have that. But the one point I wanted to make is that in a number of countries that we're seeing the slow lifting, the slow lifting, we are starting to see in some countries some increase in case numbers. And that delay is about a two to three week delay from the time that the lifting of the lockdown starts. And that's important because we know the incubation period, which is the time from when someone is exposed to the time they develop symptoms, is on average five, six days, which means that between five, six days and then another five, six days, you may see more and more cases. And so to have the data, the system in place, the public health infrastructure in place to capture that data means you need to track these individuals over time. So while some countries are starting to see an increase again, again with the lifting of those lockdowns, that is not necessarily a negative thing. We don't want to see any more cases. We want to see transmission suppressed. But it is important that, that countries are monitoring this, report those increasing in cases, and more importantly, take the measures to, to stamp it out, take the measures to suppress transmission again, because we all must remain on high alert for this and ready to detect cases and, and apply all of these measures that we know can suppress transmission. Thanks, everyone, for these uh, answers. We will conclude this uh, press briefing uh, here. You will have the audio file available uh, shortly, and transcript uh, will be posted tomorrow. We thank our interpreters once again for being with us today, as well as all speakers and all journalists who were with us online, as well as those who were watching us uh, on social media platform. Uh, there were a few minutes that we lost the signal. Uh, the, the full uh, video will be available on our 
YouTube channels and on our social media platforms as well. We will continue sending you uh, news from uh, headquarters, from our regional and from our country offices about what WHO is doing. I wish everyone a very nice evening. Thank you also to you, Tariq, and to all who have joined us today. Thank you. Have a good evening.